This is C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Next, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals oral argument in the United States versus Musawi. The court will decide if convicted 9-11 conspirator Zacharias Musawi should have his conviction overturned and receive a new trial. The court heard this case on September 25th in Richmond, Virginia. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, Justin Antoni Play of Arnold and Porter on behalf of Zacharias Massawi. <clears throat> uh, Your Honors, we've obviously had presentations before and I'm uh, prepared to discuss this important case and make a presentation. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm, I'd be pleased to start with any questions that the panel has if there are any. But uh, as we noted last time, this is a very important case about the right to counsel, uh, due process, and uh, and the Brady trilogy, and the and the and what is in fact waived as a result of a guilty plea. Uh, the McMahon, Brady, and Parker cases all make very clear that the guilty plea bar <clears throat> and the waivers contained in the guilty plea bar are based on the notion that if somebody has counsel and can fully discuss with counsel the evidence they already have and can speculate about evidence coming up, can speculate about legal rulings that may come up, that, that under those circumstances where there is full advice of counsel, there is in fact a bar and antecedent constitutional violations are in fact waived. What we have focused on and what we discussed last time here is that did not occur. There was a bar, uh, there was an interference in the communications between client and attorney. It was very important because in this case we can actually demonstrate, uh, and this is somewhat unique, that on the day that Mr. Massawi pled, his lawyers had evidence that not only the district court, but this court had concluded, based on a close review, was in fact Brady. It was material to his case and it was exculpatory to him. And yet on the day he pled, his lawyers on the record repeatedly said, we recommend that you not plead guilty. And it's undisputed that they could not discuss that evidence with him. That is unconstitutional. And it would uh, seriously deteriorate the right to counsel and broadly expand the Brady Trilogy's guilty plea bar if that is permitted. Uh, you know, I, we focused last time and we'll focus again on the critical language from McMahon. McMahon, which is one of the critical guilty plea bar cases, talks at length that the reason that antecedent constitutional violations are in fact waived in a guilty plea is counsel can predict the facts. Counsel, and this is at um, 769, 770, it's a very good discussion about why it is that antecedent constitutional violations are waived once the plea is counseled. But is it a presumption of, of, of this argument that he has a right to Brady material pre-plea? Uh, it's not a presumption, Your Honor. It's an independent constitutional violation. If the court interferes in the communications between lawyer and client, that is a very dangerous thing. And here on the record, there are filings by the uh, counsel begging the court at times and explaining that the interference in the right for the counsel to communicate with their client was deteriorating the attorney-client relationship and making the lawyer, the client very distrustful. The, the judge notes that there are times when public... Do you think there's... I, I'm, I'm wondering about what you're saying. Do you think there's an absolute right in a case for a lawyer to share with the client everything he has, even if, for instance, that information is... Say it's obtained illegally and contrary to a court order? No, Judge Shedd. Okay. Okay. And we've made that clear in our briefs. Okay. The point at which a lawyer must be able to communicate with his client is where it's on information to which the defendant and the defense is entitled. So, for example, there are cases in which a court would ask a client and a lawyer, a tell a lawyer, I'm going to be debating whether or not the following information is in fact Jenks. So there's a debate about that. The court concludes that it's not Jenks and the defendant is not entitled to it. Under those circumstances, there's no Sixth Amendment violation in preventing the lawyer and client from talking about information to which the client is not entitled. This is far different, and it, it's a, the reason we're so focused on this is there's evidence. Well, I understand that. I, I, 
And you may continue. I was just running out your argument in my mind as you make it. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the attorney-client relationship was impaired, and I want to talk briefly about why this is so important, because there's a focus on a couple of different points from our last session. One of the points uh, that came... Tell, tell, me, tell me exactly which impairment do you point to to make this argument? Is it Freeman? What is the choice of counsel? There, what, what, what is it exactly? There's a choice of counsel issue, Judge Shedd. There's also a communication with counsel. It is start with choice of counsel. Yes. As, thank to, as to whom? Uh, the district court entered an uh, To answer your question, Mr. Freeman is one of the people that I believe he could not uh, retain under the circumstances as a result of the court order. It is difficult under the circumstances for us to point to others. The judge, and I can, I can explain why. The ju it's undisputed in this case. The government concedes that... Let me just see if I, I be sure I understand what you said. You, you say, does your argument rise and fall on, on that point on Mr. Freeman? No. Okay, well, I, I didn't understand that. I said, as to whom? Well, you said counsel and then communication, communications with that counsel. Who is the counsel to which you think you have, or your client had a right to have as part of his team or his advisors that he was unable to have other than Mr. Freeman? On the communication with counsel point. No, on a communication choice of. Okay. Choice on of. choice of counsel, we cannot point to another specific lawyer. So that, so means, we, that means as to choice of counsel, is Mr. Freeman? No. The reason is, okay. under these circumstances, Judge Shedd, we can't be asked to point to another lawyer. And I'll tell you, I'll, if I can explain. The district court entered an order, and the government concedes this is at page 118 of its brief, and it's clear from the protective order, which is at uh, page JA98. The court ordered that any member of the defense team, anybody assisting the defense, had to go through a national security background check. You couple that, and by the way, that's, that order is different from and inconsistent with orders in Abu Ali, in Ray terrorist bombings, and other cases involving national security. Such an order is improper in your view? It is, it is baldly, uh, it's, it's plainly improper. In those other cases, the protective order said, if you want access to classified information, then you need a, classify, uh, a, a classification. That's not what this order said, and that's not what the judge told Massawi. Do you have any argument? Uh, w would you argue that one lawyer would, would necessarily, for full representation, have to share information received with other lawyers on the team? In other words, in a case where you know, for instance, you know national security information may be at part of the case, or part of the corpus of the case, can the court enter uh, an order limiting that only certain lawyers on the team can have access to that information? Uh, Yes, and but only to the point at which the information, in fact, becomes discoverable. The whole point of SEPA is you can have, and this is what happened in Abu Ali, it's what happened in NRA terrorist bombings. There can be either an ex parte discussion between just the court and the government where there's a determination about whether this information is, in fact, material, such that the government's privilege relating to classified information has to be compromised, or whether the government can make a decision about which version under SEPA they want to use to produce that information. Once there is a determination that the information is in fact discoverable, that it satisfies Smith, its material, and must go to the defense, it must go to the defendant and all members of the team. That's what happened in Abu Ali. There you have a case where there was, in Abu Ali, it's important that the main defense counsel never went through a national security background check. In fact, there was no need, but there was one lawyer that was in fact appointed to determine whether in fact the evidence was was needed to be produced under Smith. Once the court... Didn't one go through it and was rejected and one refused to go through it? I can't remember. I don't remember, Judge Traxler. I know that there was an appointed counsel that went through the national security background check now, and uh, this is important because the right to choose counsel and the right not to have somebody go through this back national background check only applies, and this is narrow, only applies to retained or pro bono counsel under Gonzalez Lopez. So if the court is appointed counsel, there's no right to choose counsel, and you can require somebody who's appointed counsel to go through a national security background check. What you cannot do is require somebody who wants to retain counsel or get pro bono counsel to go through a national security background check. Again, this is important, and it's structural, and that's the reason we're so focused on it. 
asking somebody and telling somebody like a, a, a defendant that you can only hire somebody when they go through the SF-86 and the full national security background check, it's an incredibly invasive process, and it's totally discretionary. As we sort of pointed out in our briefs, it's like telling one baseball team that you have to go to the other baseball team to make sure they're comfortable with your starting pitcher. It chills the ability to actually go out and get counsel, and there are people that do not want to go through this kind of a, a, a background check. It's it, incredibly invasive, and it's totally discretionary, and it's structural. It's a structural error. And as we've pointed out in our briefs, there was absolutely no reason for it. Now, let me be clear, as I was last time. Judge Brinkema and all of the counsel in the case were operating in a very difficult circumstances. We are not, we're not trying to say as that this was structural and important. We're not trying to point blame at the district court. But this was an important so, so you error. want to say they're wrong, but you don't want to insult them. We're not trying to insult them, Judge Shedd, in any way, and we've sort of said that. This was a tough case, and, and everybody was trying the best that they could. But this error, telling a defendant you can only hire somebody, anybody you hire, or retain as pro bono counsel, has to be approved by your opponent, is unconstitutional under Gonzales. Have the lawyers here today been through security clearance? I have, Your Honor, yes, sir. Uh, so that is the choice of counsel issue. Under Gonzales-Lopez, the court was very clear. Deprivation of the right to choose counsel is coextensive with the right to counsel. So if you're deprived of the right to choose counsel, you are deprived of counsel. So that can, and, and but, again, well, in appropriate circumstances, as you allow on the appointment of counsel. That's correct. Uh, and, and when I say deprived of the right to choose, I mean to limit it that way. So, and if you're deprived of the right to counsel, and, and that, that issue was still live at the time of the plea, it's an uncounseled plea. As, as Gonzalez Lopez makes absolutely clear, it's a structural error for which there's no prejudice. You cannot, as one of the courts said, Lawyers are not like apples or oranges. You can't just choose one or another. It's a personal decision. And if, if it, and in this well, 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 you don't have a right, even if you're choosing counsel, you don't have the right to counsel of your choice necessarily. That's correct. You, you, you're just saying, as I, as, I, as I take your argument, you're just saying you acknowledge that concept, <coughs> but you just think the limiting function here was unconstitutional. That's correct. You do not have unfettered discretion. There are limits. But under these circumstances, it was unconstitutional. And when you couple the, the specific, you know, this happened at a hearing. The judge told him specifically, you have to hire somebody who's national security cleared. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not quoting. But that was, the, that was what the judge said, and the government's conceded that. Uh, when you couple that with the SAMS restrictions that were in place so that Massawi couldn't go out and contact people on his own anyway, and he's told, you know, that you, you basically have to hire somebody that's national security cleared, that is an unconstitutional deprivation of counsel, and it affected his plea presumptively under Gonzalez Lopez. It's an uncounseled plea. And McMahon, Bra uh, the Brady case, um, and the uh, Parker case, the Brady trilogy, and Tollett make absolutely clear an uncounseled plea is not subject to the bars under, uh, under the Brady trilogy. Didn't, didn't uh, Mr. Musawi state at one time that Freeman, Brother Freeman would never under any circumstances be used by him or... or uh, have him appointed to be standby lawyer. Yeah, yes, I believe that that's correct, Judge. Well, did, and I'm paraphrasing too, but my understanding was Mr. Musawi said he never intended to use Mr. Freeman as his attorney. That yes, Judge Traxler, I believe that's correct. I, I, uh, that occurred after the judge told him the instruction. So you know, there was a specific order from the bench saying anybody you want to hire is national security clear. He made clear he didn't want to do that. So then he, you can tell on the transcript that he's trying to find a way that he can represent himself without having his lawyers go through the national security background check. There's discussions about that. We also cite in our briefs, I don't have them handy, but we, we cite in our briefs, he filed paper after paper after this explaining why this was outrageous to him. He did not want a lawyer that had been subjected to a national security background check. And again, We've gone into this, but under SEPA, it's not necessary. It's just not necessary. It's only if you follow SEPA the way it was followed in this case, in which you need lawyers to be cleared. If you're going to just put all of the information out there to defense counsel and presume that production of the information to defense counsel discharges all your discovery obligations, even if that information cannot be shared with the defendant, it's only in that paradigm, which is not proper under SEPA. Do you end up with a situation where defense counsel needs to be cleared? This entire was. Uh, 
Was the Abu Ali procedure ever proposed to Judge Brinkema? I don't. That type of? I don't believe so, Your Honor. There was, there were a lot of. Advocated representation. I'm sorry, Judge. I just want to make sure. My recollection is nobody ever proposed the Abu Ali procedure to Judge Brinkema. I don't believe they did, Judge Traxler. There are a lot of pleadings after classified Brady materials were produced to the defense counsel in which they say in writing, this stuff needs to be produced to us in a manner that we can share it with Massawi. And in fact, you know, we say this in our brief. Not one argument in our case is based on the notion that Massawi was entitled to classified information. Not one. We are not asking for that. We don't think it would be common sense under the circumstances. What we are saying is SEPA requires something different than what occurs here, than what occurred here. It requires the court actually make a determination. Once it determines that the information is material and must go to the defense, you have to go through the SEPA process, which is either produce some version of the information in declassified form, or you do what they did in in-ray terrorist bombings, where you stipulate the facts and agree to facts. But under any of those circumstances, the lawyers and the client can talk about the information, and you don't have all of the other violations that took place here. Once that information is produced in that form, the attorney and the client can prepare for the case. They can make decisions. You know, some of the decisions we've noted, like the decision to plead guilty, the decision to waive a jury trial, they're personal decisions. If that information has not gone to the defendant, he's making that. It can't possibly be a knowing decision to make. Is there any question but that he knew the process was ongoing and hadn't reached its completion? That is the ultimate determination as to what parts of the classified information he was going to receive prior to the case going forward. I think he, I'll answer it two ways. One, he knew the process was ongoing, but as to this evidence, the SEPA 4 process was complete. It was finished. Second point I'd say is that even if this court concludes that the ongoing nature of the process is relevant, that's only relevant to the Fifth Amendment argument, the Brady argument. It does not cure the Sixth Amendment argument. And again, we have, when preparing for this argument this time again, we went back and I prepared a chart, which I'm happy to file. I think we filed enough paper, so I'm reluctant to put anything else before the court. In three categories. Here's some, for category one was evidence that this court and the district court had concluded was Brady, but that Massawi, concededly Massawi and his lawyers could not talk about it. So you have a court of appeals ruling that it's Brady. There's other evidence that the district court specifically concluded was Brady, but had not reached the court of appeals. And again, on that evidence, Massawi could not discuss it in the McMahon sense, in the Parker McMahon Brady sense before the plea. There's a third category of evidence that is plainly Brady, but there was no specific finding of that in advance of the plea. But again, it was evidence that the lawyers had that couldn't discuss. Again, the court's obviously familiar with the extensive case law under Brady. It is very difficult to satisfy Brady. There's a lot to that. When a judge finds that evidence is Brady, that's not a small thing. And the notion that a lawyer could possess Brady at the time of a plea and not be able to discuss it with his client and that that plea would be upheld, it damages not only for Massawi, and this is what we've made the point about, it's not only a Massawi thing, it's broader than that. It's going to be used in other cases. It not only harms the right to counsel broadly, but it broadly expands the guilty plea bar under McMahon, Parker, and Brady. There's just no basis for it. None of the Brady trilogy stand for the proposition that an uncounseled plea is somehow gets the benefit of that guilty plea bar. When does, in a general case, when does Brady material have to be turned over? What's the latest point at which the failure to turn over Brady is a violation? The cases, and I don't believe there's one from this case, this court specifically, I don't remember off the top of my head, I apologize. But most of the cases talk about it as sufficiently in advance of trial to permit the use at trial. Well, I just wonder, was your argument maybe make the point of not giving Brady material earlier rather than later? Because you make the argument if Brady material is in the possession of counsel, then it's impossible to have a client knowingly plead if they don't, if the lawyer can't pass that material on. 
Well, is your argument cut against an early open file policy by a prosecutor? The prosecutor just says, I'll turn it over when the law forces me to do it. And there's nothing, no, nothing necessarily wrong with that choice. But I'm not going to get into the argument that Mr. Anthony Bly makes. Judge Shedd, uh, I think the, the way the test is articulated as to when you should get it is not based on a particular date and time. It's no, based no, it's on not time. It's where you are in the process. Yeah, and the, the re I agree. But I think the prosecution and the government would be operating at its peril to delay, and I think that I'm not suggesting this ever occurs, but to delay production of Brady I'm once they're aware of it. And I understand your but point. But my question was, doesn't your argument maybe counsel against early, 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 earlier than is required uh, supplying of Brady material? I don't believe it does, Judge you don't? Shedd. I don't. Uh, may I continue? Yeah. Can you finish that? Sure. Uh, I don't believe it does because uh, it's not the, the whole point of Brady is a due process. It's a fairness. It's a due process. The cases don't set black and white deadlines. I, I know that. I know yeah. that. Yeah. Maybe we'll stop now. I know that. But even you acknowledge there is a general rule on when it is to be supplied. That's correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chief Judge Traxler. May it please the court. Kevin Gingras on behalf of the United States. This is a case about a defendant who pleaded guilty unconditionally and against the vigorous advice of his counsel. And it was clear that he understood that he was forever raving his right to challenge his factual guilt before the plea or to complain about any district court rulings that preceded the plea. And then a year later, he gets up at his capital sentencing trial and he gets up on the stand and he proudly proclaims his guilt and he testified that he rejoiced in the nearly 3,000 deaths that resulted from his conspiracies. The only real questions before this court, then, are whether Misawi knew and understood the nature of the charges against him and the consequences of pleading guilty. And if he did, did he choose to do so free of coercion? Now, the circumstances surrounding the plea leave no serious doubt that the answer to each of those questions is yes. If I can... I'll just turn to the, uh, the question of the bar and whether he was uncounseled, constructively uncounseled, because he couldn't discuss the quote-unquote Brady information um, that he was entitled to. The, the, the information to which Mr. Antonio Play is referring is the information that this court said he was going to get and that this court said was exculpatory and was going to aid in his defense. And it was information that he, as a pro se defendant, asked for. He asked for these witnesses and said, they're going to exonerate me. Here's what they're going to say. So this notion that he is completely in the dark about exculpatory information or that he has no idea that he's going to be entitled to use it is just not supported by the well, record. Well, can you admit that Mr. Anthony Pillai possibly be talking about the same information? He says his information that counsel had, Brady material, that the counsel could not pass on to uh, the defendant before he pled guilty. And you say that's not so. That, that's right, Your Honor. Is that sort of where we are this morning? Well, the, the information to which he's referring, because uh, he referred to the sort of SEPA process that was unfolding right. At, right at the time of the plea. Uh, if, if I'll just step back, Judge Shedd, and for the, the chronology is that uh, this court issued its last opinion in the compulsory process uh, litigation in September of 2004, and this court had concluded that he is entitled to use the information of uh, the substitutions for witnesses B and C. His counsel then filed a cert petition with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court denied cert uh, in April of 2005, and when that happened, the process starts anew to create these substitutions that this court said to go ahead and create to get him the information. So that's the information we're talking about. He knows it's coming to him, and yet he decides he's had enough and he wants to plead. So in other yep. words, you, you reconcile what appears to be a difference. And the fact is he may not have had it, but he knew generally what it was, and he also knew that at some point under the orders of the court he was going to get something. Exactly. And if we can distinguish between the three witnesses at issue in this court's opinion, there's witness A, B, and C, and we're talking about the information that he hasn't yet gotten is witness B and C. He got witness A. This court originally had remanded. What happened is the district court 
in the spring of 2003 says he's entitled to have a Rule 15 deposition of Witness A. The government appealed. This court remanded and said consider substitutions. He actually gets a limited disclosure of the government's proposed substitution, which was still then technically classified for public distribution but declassified with respect to him. So he sees exactly how this process is going to work. He then later asks for Witness B and C. That litigation is stayed while the Court of Appeals, this court, resolves the access question. And so he knows he's going to get the exact same thing for Witnesses B and C. The fact of the matter was he didn't. I apologize, Judge Gregg. Counsel, let's get back. I thought the question that Judge Shedd asked, but if it's not his question, it's mine. Are you saying that counsel was incorrect when he said there was Brady information that he was instructed by the court not to disclose to his client? Is that you're saying that's not true? I'm saying that the – Let's put it in a positive. Was there Brady material that counsel was instructed not to convey to his client? Yes or no? I don't know that it would be Brady information, Your Honor, because it was – as we point out in our brief, to call it Brady refers to its use at trial. There might have been exculpatory material, Brady-type material that he was going to have access to, and it's not that they couldn't talk to him about it. I mean, they couldn't go through, I think, the sort of specifics of the information, for example, the sources and methods and things like that. But with regard to the information itself, he's the one who originally asked for it. So you're saying – just a simple question. Was there information that they could not share with their client, that what you would call Brady-ish, Brady-esque, Brady-like, Brady-something? Was there information that they could not share with their client? There was definitely classified information that they could not discuss with them under the protective order. All right. Now, you say, like Christmas, it's coming. You're going to eventually get it. It was Judge Shea who was questioning you and nodding your head. I assume you were agreeing with him and saying it's coming. He knew it was coming. But the question is this. The court ordered the nondisclosure, correct? The court – Whatever it was. That's not – we know we can't agree on whether it was Brady or not, but we can agree the court ordered the nondisclosure to the client, correct? There was the protective order issued by the district court with the consent of the defense. Okay. It's coming, but now an event is right before the court, a guilty plea. Wouldn't the court know now, whether it's coming or not, now is the time this client needs to be informed before entering a guilty plea? So even if it's coming later, now is now. But don't you think – wouldn't the court know that and have a responsibility under the Sixth Amendment to make sure that's given to the client so it's informed? I agree, Your Honor, if that information – if he didn't have that information. I mean, he knew what the information was, and he knew that he was going to get it. So if there were some sort of – He, you mean Massawi? Massawi. He knew exactly what somebody else had said. Indeed, he did. He's the one who asked for that information. How would he know exactly what someone said? What someone said. Well, he may not – I apologize, Your Honor. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Are you saying he's a diviner? No, and I apologize, Judge Gregory. What I mean to say is he's the one who first asked for these witnesses, alleging generally what they're going to say. It's certainly true, and I misspoke if I said that he knew what the government had, the statements that the government had. But he does have this court's public opinion, which talks about how the information was exculpatory, would allow him to argue that he wasn't part of the 9-11 conspiracy, would go both to guilt and to the penalty phase, would provide him with a roadmap – this court, excuse me, essentially provide him with a roadmap on how to use it. So our point is simply that the idea that he was completely in the dark about this information is not – is simply not the case. And so if you assume that a defendant has Brady, quote, unquote, Brady rights before the plea, Judge Gregory, then perhaps a district court would have a duty under those circumstances to make sure that a defendant understands what he is waiving before pleading guilty. But that simply wasn't the case here because the defendant knew what was out there, and he is the one who cuts the process off at the knees by insisting on pleading guilty against the advice of his counsel. And the reality is that he was the one who chose not to talk with his counsel. This is not a situation where you have 
a client and their counsel, and there's this wall between them, and, you know, they're just not able to discuss certain pieces of information because they're classified. He just rejected his counsel outright. But he didn't bring all this thing on. It's clear on that. As far as, say, he brought on himself, I've been on this case from the very beginning, at least from the Fourth Circuit. I remember when he was trying to get Freeman as his counsel. The whole idea of the counsel he chose, he couldn't get the counsel he chose. And it went back and forth as to what he could get under SEPA and those things. And you're saying all of this is left to him, that he cut the process off the knees. So basically the court should have never had the like of the prohibition on disclosure since you said he knew what it was anyway. Well, what was the purpose of that? With regard to, Your Honor, with regard to the choice of counsel issue, the fact that he knew what the information was certainly goes to their Brady-type claim. I can discuss the choice of counsel, which I think is, and there are a couple of points that Mr. Antonio played that I want to, made that I want to address. The first is that we had conceded that the district court ordered that anybody who represented him have a national security clearance and that this somehow prohibited Freeman from representing him. I would strongly disagree with that characterization. The district court never ordered that anyone who represented him had to have a national security clearance. The protective order is not, it doesn't make a. If his lawyers were, were his lawyers under the order unable to discuss with him specific information that they had in their possession? They could not divulge classified information to Ms. Epps. Did that order also, or any restrictions also mean they could not say to him, we're telling you good things are around the corner? But could they, could they describe it to him or counsel him in that type way? Oh, absolutely, Your Honor. I think. They could tell him that? They could, and they're perfect, there's a perfect example of this in the record, actually. In July of 2002, Massawi tried to plead guilty at one point, and he's pro se at this time. And defense counsel files a pleading with the district court and sends it to Massawi and says, Judge Brinkman, you need to explain to Massawi that if he pleads guilty, he's not going to get some of this exculpatory information that we're seeing. This is before the witnesses are at issue. So they knew how to raise this issue with the court and with Massawi. Can I address your response to Judge Shea's question to you? You mean to tell me you think that, first of all, you know, counsel can never guarantee any result to a client. That would be unethical, correct? That's right. So you mean to tell me if the lawyer knows exactly what a witness is going to say and he or she believes it's favorable, but he can't tell the client, it's the same thing to say, believe me, trust me, I guarantee what this person is going to say is going to, you're going to be scot-free, you're going to win, but I can't tell you what it is. That's the same thing as being able to sit down and say, look, this is exactly what this person, you think that's the equivalent to, that complies with the Sixth Amendment? Well, I wouldn't say that the first part of your question, I wouldn't say it's the equivalent. Certainly not. There's definitely a difference, but I don't think that it violates the Sixth Amendment. It doesn't? No. With respect, Your Honor, I think the question is that the court has asked in these types of cases when you're analyzing the communication with counsel is, does the government have some sort of important interest that is at stake and are the restrictions carefully tailored to meet that interest? Now, obviously the government's interest here is at its apex with national security information, but the tailoring is certainly careful because, and this is an intensely context-specific inquiry, embassy bombings is a perfect example of this. The government is working to declassify the information, to get it to Misawi. Was there a plea agreement in this case? There's no plea agreement, Your Honor. I'm going to ask you this. In the scenario, and by the way, I wasn't suggesting anything with my question. I was just exploring your theory like I did other counsel's theory. Certainly. If you had a potential plea agreement in which a person was given, say, acceptance of responsibility and some real chance at a reduced sentence, in that scenario, might the analysis be different because there you have pressure brought to bear on a defendant to reject his lawyer's advice not to plead in order to get something proffered by the government, that reduced sentence? Does that, would that enter as compared or contrasted with a situation where it's just a straight-up plea? Would that matter in your analysis? Would it matter? As to whether or not he might, a court might think the defendant was actually counseled in the meaning of the Sixth Amendment. You understand my question? In one case, there's pressure brought to bear on the defendant to plead guilty for a better deal, 
And so he's rejecting advice of counsel. That's right. Even though he may not articulate, he goes, I, I'd rather get three points off and look at 30 years in jail or 25 years in jail than maybe go to life as compared to a situation where there's, there's no, no plea agreement. I'm just trying to, and the reason I'm asking that question is I'm trying to focus on the defendant. And, and the defendant at that point, what is the defendant thinking? Do you think that makes a difference? It may go to the question of the voluntariness of the defendant's actions. I mean, I think that would that be, be right. that'd be fair game to examine, Your Honor, absolutely. With, with regard to the uh, information that was provided to the defense counsel that was not provided to the defendant himself, was there any initial obligation on the government to give anything to defense counsel? I mean, it seemed to me that the SEPA does not really contemplate the process y'all were using, that is, that you were providing it to defense counsel. Um, so I'm just wondering, was there ever any obligation under the law to have given that information to defense counsel at that stage? Uh, I don't know that there was, Your Honor. I mean, I think, I think what was happening was the Section 4 process was essentially unfolding with declassified uh, and redacted versions of materials going to Misawi personally. There's, again, we're talking about one of the largest investigations in the history of the United States. There was tons of information. The government chooses, the government chooses to be more, more to, to err on the side of caution and to disclose information that is even arguably relevant. Okay. That's that still classified. That and that answers my question. Okay. Let me ask, I want to go on to another point. Okay. Because I, I want you to address the uh, issue that Appellant opened with, um, and I'll try to paraphrase it as I understand it. He can correct me if I'm wrong. But my understanding is he says that Judge Brinkham adopted a rule that no one could represent this defendant unless they passed a security clearance, that Mr. Freeman refused to do that, that Mr. Massawi would not take any lawyer who had done that, and that he was then Massawi was effectively denied counsel because this was an unconstitutional limitation. And right. you address that? And, and Judge Traxler, the, 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 the order, the quote-unquote order that Mr. Antonio Play cites that we apparently conceded in our brief, or he says we conceded in our brief, is actually comments that the district court made at the first pretrial conference in April 2002. And that happens in the context of Massawi saying, I want to waive my counsel, uh, my right to counsel, and I want to go pro se. And she, in that context, reminds him, that he has a right to choose his counsel. And he's insistent, no, I want to, I want to be pro se. And when she's talking about his right to choose counsel, she meant she, the, the import of her comments is that the universe of who you can choose is limited in the sense of if you want that attorney to see everything. Yeah, but she repeats that requirement when she's talking to Brother Freeman or talking about Brother Freeman, yeah. that, that he has not passed the background investigation, so he's not going to be allowed to... With respect, Judge Traxler, I disagree. That, that conversation takes place in, at the, the Ferretta colloquy in June of 2002, um, where he they start talking about Brother Freeman, and she says, look, your pro bono counsel is going to be subject to the same restrictions that your appointed counsel are, are, are subject to. That is, if they're going to see classified information, then they need to go through a background check. Uh, and th there's going to be some restrictions in your communication, if that's the case. And she also mentions a preliminary background check. And that is at, uh, with the court's indulgence, uh, at, our, at our brief on page 121. Um, this is an example of the same requirements that a pro bono counsel would have to go through. Well, she says on page 657, because Mr. Freeman has not been qualified to lawfully represent the defendant in this court, he may not sit inside the well. What is she referring to there? there she, she's referring to Mr. Freeman's refusal to file a notice of appearance to associate pro hoc vice, basically to be bound by the local rules. So your position is that he was forbidden to represent Musawi because of reasons other than his refusal to Participate in the Absolutely, and, and there's two points I would make. The, the first, the answer is yes, that I would that I would agree with that. You know, the second is, Masawi never wants Freeman to represent him. He only wants Freeman to be his standby counsel. That's the only time Freeman is in play, uh, and so the the his right to have a standby advisor is certainly uh, less than his right to have uh, full blown counsel. 
and, and the restrictions that the district court can impose uh, are certainly, uh, and the record uh, is clear that the restrictions she was imposing were minimal. Simply Counsel, file a notice of appearance and you wouldn't do it. Counsel, you, I mean, you move rather fast. I apologize, Your Honor. You were, you were telling, answering the question about what did, what did you, you call it comments. What did judge, the district court judge say about restrictions in the first place? In, in the, which place? I about when, when Brother Freeman wanted to be counsel as to whether or not he had to have national security clearance. She, she never said Brother Freeman had to have a national security what was, clearance. What were, her, what were her comments? She mentions a preliminary background clearance, a preliminary background check, to which he says, I have no problem with that. And the preliminary background check is simply, uh, is the person who's going to see an accused terrorist themselves a criminal or terrorist? I mean, that's, it's as simple as that. Are you going to pass a preliminary background check, and are you going to file a notice of appearance uh, and follow the local rules? So what, that's a security clearance, isn't it? I, with respect, it's not, and I don't think Mr. Antonio Pillay is making that claim. The security clearance is, as he says, invasive, requires all sorts of background information that you have to fill out on the SF-86 uh, to get a top secret uh, or, or secret clearance. It's, 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 it, it is different, Your Honor. And that's the only comment you made about Brother Freeman's? That he had to just to check whether or not he had a criminal record. That was the the, the, the the she mentions the preliminary background and then the notice of appearance that he's going to have to comply with the local rules, which he refuses to do. She gives him almost two months, I believe, and he won't do it. And he's filing, he's ghostwriting pleadings and filing them on Masawi's behalf. Masawi's insisting that he sit with him at council table. But you uh, said she was saying that it's going to be a narrow universe, didn't you say that? And initially, say, when you start off, you said he wanted to represent himself. And what did she tell him? And you were, you were saying on the record, this, this, the, I'm referring to the preliminary, or excuse me, the first pre-trial conference in right. what did she 2002. Tell him? And she says that uh, when he says he wants to waive his right to counsel and go pro se, she makes sure he understands that he has a right to choose counsel. And she, that's when she mentions the background, or excuse me, the security clearance. And I, that's what she said, what? What did she say? I, I don't have the direct quote in front of me, but I think she, she says that your counsel is going to be limited, your tr the, the counsel that you can choose is going to be limited because of the security clearance requirement. A security, and, she said security clearance, didn't she? Th those are her comments in the pretrial clearance. Absolutely. She said comments, her, that's what she said. I mean, the court, that is what the she court says, speaks right. by its oral or written words, correct? That's true, Your Honor. And if, if, in fact, that were some kind of order, she certainly corrects that later at the later hearings. And the protective order, again, is, is, is not, it's, the language is clear. It's not mandatory. Uh, there are no further questions. Uh, and I would... The court will permit me. I'd just like to sum up by saying that at the sentencing hearing, when the district court told him Sal he was going to spend the rest of his life in the maximum security prison, he replied with four words that really say all that needs to be said for this appeal. That was my choice, and so we respectfully ask this court to affirm that knowing and voluntary choice, uh, his choice to plead guilty. Thank you, Antonio Pillay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I've, obviously, again, I will start with any questions the panel <coughs> has. Um, on the choice of counsel point, I'll just address it briefly. The government's brief at page 118, this is, if I overcharacterize it, I apologize, but this is what it says. The district court advised Massawi, among other things, that he had a right, quote, right to hire an attorney at his own expense, end quote but that the right was limited by the protective order requirement that all counsel receive appropriate security clearances before reviewing classified information. That's what the brief says. At page 98 of the joint appendix, there's the protective order. At paragraph 13, it says, I'm not going to read it, but it says, all counsel and all persons whose assistance the defense reasonably requires have to go through the full national security background check. That's what the order says. Then, at the hearing on April 22nd, the judge says, you have a right to hire an attorney at your own expense. I'm sorry, I apologize. You have the right to hire an attorney at your own expense of your choice. However, in this kind of case, where there are national security and classified documents, 
You don't have totally unrestricted choice, even if you have the money available to hire an attorney, because the attorneys, as you know, because you've seen a copy of it, have to be able to be cleared to receive some of the information in this case, not all of it, but some of it. I think a reasonable... Per no, you finish that. You don't finish. I think you're talking, the judge is addressing a pro se defendant personally with that order, with that language. Okay. A reasonable... Me, but didn't Mr. Musawi say no lawyer was ever going to represent him? Your Honor... She, Even a Muslim lawyer wasn't going to represent him. I don't... I don't know what he would have done had he known he could hire a lawyer that did not have to be approved by the government. This is the point we keep making. He was told by the judge, any lawyer that you hire personally has to be approved and cleared by the government. He did say language like that, Your Honor, and, and I, you know, that the record is what it is. He did say that. But when a judge addresses a pro se defendant personally and tells the defendant what I just read to the court, a reasonable person in that situation, listening to the judge saying that, would think that he was restricted in who he could hire to, a, a, to lawyers approved by the government and cleared. That's our point. That is an unconstitutional restriction on the choice of counsel. I, we strongly believe that the Freeman issue came down to that issue, but the record is just not full on that. And again, you have issues with communications with counsel, which I'm sure were never made public on the record. Why it is that he ultimately didn't appear, enter an appearance is just not fully developed in the record. Our point is, this is a clearly unconstitutional restriction. You just cannot tell a defendant he can only hire somebody that the opponent approves. And it's unnecessary for all the reasons we've talked about. We know that we know that counsel was urging or counseling uh, the defendant not to plead guilty. Is that correct? That's correct. Is it clear why they were doing that? Uh, it's not in the record. Uh, and, Your Honor, Judge Shedd, let me, if, if the court would permit me, address the points the government made about information that's out there, that was out there before he pled. I'll say it, I'll address it in a couple of ways. One, there were a number of times where the, where the defendant is asking for access to witnesses, and as the court will recall, the standard set by the court in terms of what you have to prove to get access to the witnesses is a materiality requirement. So he's speculating in a lot of these filings. He's saying... I think so-and-so will say X, trying to set, prove that the witness is material. And the government is now using those pleadings and those statements in which he's speculating and trying to prove materiality to say he actually knew that information. That's just not correct. He did not know what the witnesses were going to say. He certainly didn't know what KSM and uh, Hassawi ultimately testified to a trial. He just did not know it, even though his, his lawyers did at the time. But if I could, I'd like to be a little bit more practical uh, just as a lawyer who defends clients, how insidious it is to have this restriction in place. You go to your client and you say, I don't think you should plead guilty. I feel very strongly about it. Your client will ask you, any client will ask you why. In most cases, you can say, I've seen a statement from so-and-so so and so, it makes me very nervous. This is all hypothetical. I, 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 it makes me very nervous, and I think that evidence is going to be harmful to you. Clients do all kinds of things with that premise. Some clients will say, "You know, I know so and so." What if you tell them? What if you tell them? I believe that you're hypothetical. I believe that. I know you want to plead guilty, but I'm telling you, good things are coming. The court has ordered you're going to get it. Just hold on. You're going to get this information. I don't think the and they say why? No, thank you. I want to plead guilty. Judge said, first of all, the client, the lawyers could not have said that at the time. They did not know what and when he would get it. They'd been asking repeatedly that this information, even after, let me be clear, that this court had ruled that these particular substitutions should go to Massawi. On April 7th, April 7th, just a few weeks before the plea, the lawyers filed another pleading asking that these very substitutions be shared with Massawi. So we're talking just days before the plea. Yes, let me ask you this, though. You didn't think in this case that you were losing those, those court cases, did you? You didn't think that, those, that that information could be withheld. You thought that, in fact, the substitutions were ordered so that an information in some form could be supplied. Did, isn't that what you thought? No, Judge Shedd. You, you thought you were losing that? No, no, I wouldn't say that. I apologize. But the, the discretion about whether to actually turn that information over to Massawi is solely an executive second uh, Article II power. 
The government can decide not to turn that information over. I don't think any lawyer would say – Which case law would happen? There are sanctions for the government, but, you know, as the court knows, it moves. My only point is – My point – let's move from the hypothetical to this case. You know, you have a sense of a case, and you know when you seem to be generally winning and generally losing. Did you think at that point that the tie was running against the defendant, that he had lost his court cases, the government was going to be able to withhold the information, there would be no substitutions, and he would still be prosecuted in the absence of that information? That's not the posture of the case then, was it? Judge Shedd, first of all, I did not – I was not counsel. I know, but I'm saying – So I think a reasonable person could debate quite strongly whether or not the Fourth Circuit's decision was a win for Massawi or not. It did compromise the right to compulsory process, and it made clear that it would be very difficult to get those witnesses in court. I don't know is the answer. I think it's possible. One could view it positively. I'm not going to concede that they did. I'm not trying to be fishy. It's just it was a major decision, and it did affect the right to compulsory process. My point is just the right to counsel your client is an important one. It's a critical one. And there are orders and discussions where the district court is having, as a result of the improper, incorrect CEPR process, having to manage what the lawyer – how the lawyer is going to talk to the client. And we've cited these things. Say it this way. Say it that way. On Brady, and my point is when you actually have a client that's approaching a decision this serious, they may disagree with your premise. Let me just take the hypothetical now because I'm trying to understand the principle. In another case, there is information that the lawyer believes is there and believes that will be made available. And the client goes, no, I want to plead guilty. And the lawyer goes, no, I'm just telling you. There's information that I know is out there, and I believe we will, in fact, win this debate eventually. You will get that information, and it's going to be very helpful to you. At that point, you're saying no client could possibly plead guilty. That's an uncounseled plea under the circumstances. I'm not saying – I have to say I'm answering it in the context of what we say. In the absolute situation, as long as the counsel has information to which the defendant is entitled, if he can't discuss it, just saying you're going to get it someday is just not enough. And it's because your premise of your recommendation may be wrong. The client may disagree with it. If I went to any client and just say I recommend that you agree with me and that we ought to go to trial. What if the client goes, look, I know. I know exactly what happened. I know, and I want to plead guilty. I know. And there may be other people. There may be information that somehow might cast it in a positive light. But I want to do this. I understand. But you would say that still is an uncounseled plea. Your Honor, yes, because the reason is, Judge Shedd, it's extraordinary, and it should not happen, that you can tell a lawyer he cannot talk about material exculpatory information with his client. You just can't counsel a client under those circumstances. No, no, my point wasn't that you can't tell him that. My point was the timing of it. And the timing of it in my hypothetical was, in fact, the lawyer knows and believes that the information, well, the lawyer knows the information is there, and the lawyer believes the information more than believes, say, the court. I can tell from the way the court talked to us today, you're going to get that information. Don't be rash. Don't plead guilty. So, in other words, the information the lawyer has is not maybe, I'm trying to frame it not that he can't give it or she can't give it to the client. It's just going to be delayed. But you say even that is a violation. Yes, Your Honor. May I finish the answer? May I make it real short because I want to ask you another question. Yes, very well. The burden, I believe, Your Honor, Judge Shedd, I believe that the burden is being shifted in a way that it shouldn't. You have an order that prevents communication. No, no, I understand. No, I understand the answer. You were not answering that. It was hypothetical. I understand. Thank you. Well, then it seems to me we come back to the question I think I asked you the first time we were here. Are you saying that the judge should not have accepted his plea until the SEPA process had played out and he had been given what he was entitled to? I don't believe that. I wouldn't phrase it quite that way. I don't believe the judge could have accepted the plea on the day the way it was. There was a motion pending to get these very substitutions in a manner that could be discussed between attorney and client. I'm going to have to address some of this in the closed session to finish my answer. But the SEPA, I think what I would say is the SEPA process was not followed early. It had a number of results that created a very bad atmosphere, 
and it really spoiled the relationship between the attorney and client. It could, it's possible it could have been fixed if it had been cured before the plea. But the judge knowing and having been alerted that the lawyers had Brady that they could not discuss with their client leaves that plea uncounseled. The uncounseled nature of the plea has to be cured or you have to do a FREDA or some kind of waiver of it, knowing waiver of it, which I'm not sure you could do under the circumstances, but you cannot take the plea under these circumstances. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll come down and greet counsel and then move over to the uh, closed session. Thank you, Your Honor. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals originally heard this case in January, but ordered a rehearing after one member of the panel, Chief Judge Karen Williams, retired for health reasons before the case could be decided. The court has not issued a ruling yet. You can listen to this program again or read more about the case at cspan.org. Just click on America and the Courts under the C-SPAN series link. And join us next week for America and the Courts, Saturday evenings at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN. This is C-SPAN, public affairs, pro public affairs programming.